Hey there, listeners. Well, welcome to another episode of the Leadership is Changing podcast. And I had a great interview with a guy by the name of Sharat Putharaju. And Sharat shared a whole lot of great stuff. Now, he's the co founder and CEO of an organization called Beacon Step. Now, the title of the episode is Micromanage the Process, Not the Person. And he talked about that a little bit, and it was really good. But the other things we talked about was the fact that be really true to what you are pursuing in business, in your career, and in life. And then the other thing too was, how do we bridge the physical world to the digital world? And if you think about things like AI and a whole lot of other stuff happening, and technology happening so fast, it's making change go faster. And then the other one was around the seeds of leadership and how to empower people to make decisions. Too many people are diminishes in the way the sense of leaders and they're holding people back and not allowing people time or the ability to go out there and make decisions and multiply, fly and do very well. So this is an awesome interview. So sit back and enjoy. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey there, listeners. Welcome to another wonderful episode of the Leadership is Changing podcast. Great to have you here with us. I've got a great guest with me today. His name is Sharat Patharaju, and it's wonderful to have you on the show, Sharat. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here on this uh, show. Awesome. Now, for people who are listening to this episode right now, we're about say you in the world today. So I'm actually based out of Bangalore in India. It's a city in South India. My offices are actually in Bangalore and New York. So I shuttle every six to eight weeks between Bangalore and New York. In New York. Wow. You're pretty close to each other, eh? What a trip that is. Very close. Just about 14 or 15 hours by flight. Yeah. And, and that <laughs> flight, so when you do travel from Bangalore to New York, which way do you go? How do you fly? Do you go into Singapore and then from there to direct or how do you do it? I'm a very loyal Emirates flying customer. So I've always flown, flown through Dubai and I think Emirates gives you the best bang for buck. Yeah, cool. So you go from then Dubai straight into New York. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So I fly Bangalore, Dubai, New York. Oh, to, oh, wow. Excellent. Yeah, that's very good. Alrighty. So that's good to know. So you're based in Bangalore, or as we know, the state is known as Karnataka. You're based there. HPX used to have a, or still does have offices there in Electronic City. Huge presence. Yeah. Yeah. So big presence here. So that's good. And so I've already given an introduction to the audience about you a little bit, but love to know more because I think you're the co-founder and the CEO of an organization called Beacon Stack. And so I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about that organization, but also tell us more about what you've done and where you've come from in your career. Thanks again for having me. Just a minute primer on who I am and my background. So I'm actually, I'm born and raised in India, actually by... I did my undergraduation in, in chemical engineering, which is very far away from what I actually do right now. After doing chemical engineering, I was did a master's program in engineering management at Duke in the US. Was an investment banker with Merrill Lynch for a couple of years, working on Wall Street, doing mergers and acquisitions, buyouts, and all the other good stuff. Always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Wanted to become an entrepreneur far before I knew what it was to become one. I think if I knew actually what it took to be an entrepreneur, I might not have done it. <laughs> but it's one of those things that only can be taught when you're actually on the ground doing it. Always excited. I was always excited about kind of building my own business, trying to do something from zero to one. That was also all the more exciting or interesting because there is nobody in my family who actually has a business background. My mother is a teacher or a professor. My father is a banker, and we come from pretty professional middle class families. But but this excitement of trying to build something from scratch. It was it was a niche that I was very excited about, I would say, since my teens and kept kind of working on it, kept getting excited about what entrepreneurship is all about. And I was fortunate to kind of embark on this entrepreneurial journey a little over 10 years back with my co-founder, Ravi, who is also my classmate and friend from fifth grade. 
Oh, wow. So, yeah. So we've, we've known each other for many years before it actually really happened. Wow. And have you, like, for years been talking together about it and about doing the business together? Yeah, a little bit. So, like I said, we've been classmates from just grade, went to school, went to high school, went to in- undergrad engineering together. We're also roommates in New York for some time. I think since we were in our 20s or even slightly earlier than that, we talked about being entrepreneurs. I think we were talking about being entrepreneurs for about a decade before we actually started it. So wow. that's the exciting part. Yeah, yeah, very good. Now, I've got a couple of other questions to ask you in, in relation to what you just shared. And I'm going to get you to explain a little bit more about the company that you both co-founded and what it does. Yeah. Now, before we go there, though, that itch that you talked about, you had that, right, you wanted to start something from scratch, do your own business and things like that, and came from a background whereby mum and dad were doing things, well, more or less working for another somebody else, right, as employees and so forth. Right. That itch, there's probably people who are listening to this episode right now who are either in their teens and they're thinking about doing it, or they're in the corporate job and they're sick and tired of the corporate world. They want to go out and start their own business, or somebody who's in a business today, but maybe wanting to start another business. What was the transition like for you to go from, say, doing that investment banker and then going out into doing your own world your own business as well, in the great big world. What was it like for you? It was a very interesting change. And I think I've kind of summarized this a couple of times, uh, in this, uh, a couple of times. And I used to joke about the fact that when I was in investment bank, I would come home anywhere between midnight and two o'clock in the morning every day because bankers work very long hours. But then I would sleep like a baby <laughs> for the few hours I slept. But as an entrepreneur, you kind of, you have all the flexible hours that you have. I would come back home at five or six in the evening, but I can't really sleep because that is, it's always on. I think the big difference that you see about entrepreneurship is that it's almost like a lifestyle change, if you think about it, because there is no longer like a church and state separation. There is nothing called, this is personal life, this is work life. When people talk about work-life balance, I strongly believe in it. But I think the thing about being an entrepreneur is you can't switch off. Because you're always thinking about work. You might be sleeping, you might be working out in the gym, you might be at a meal with friends. It's very hard not to kind of switch off and not think about work. The way I'm saying it sounds like it's a downside, but I think in some ways it's an upside because it gives you a certain sense of purpose. Like you talked about, Dennis, about your own journey about starting this podcast. It gives you that, what I call the raison d'etre, the reason for existence. And that's very exciting. And I think I can't recommend it enough to people. Yeah, I can't either. At times, and you've probably as well as me, it's like, what the heck have we done? And you've mentioned Good. that earlier on as well, but I think it's, it's just great to do it. You know what I really like about it is the fact that you can take, and you mentioned it before, going from zero to one, things like that, or you're taking something from nothing at all and you from scratch, as you said yes. before, and then you grow it into something and with your hands, with your thoughts, with your energy as well, and just being able to do that. It's, it's exciting to, to create it and that, but it's exciting to see it come to life as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is incredibly exciting. And I think that's kind of what makes me kind of wake up every day and run toward what I'm really trying to do. I, I think the excitement of being an entrepreneur or the downside of being an entrepreneur is the fact that the highs are very high and the lows are very low. And the day you have a high, you got to kind of savor it for uh, enough amount of time just so that when those lows come, you remember the high to keep you propelling forward. I think when you if you're not when you're in a regular working a salary job, I think the highs and the lows are much lot more closer to the median versus when you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And you know when you talk about those highs and those lows, and you're talking about savoring those highs to help you when you're in those lows. Is it really important for, and I actually think it's not just for entrepreneurs, I actually think it's for leaders as well in general, even it doesn't matter what, whether they're in a sporting team or whether they're in corporate world, whatever it is, I think it's really important for them to understand their why, their purpose, because that's the thing that's going to really remind them why they're doing this and to really pull them up and lift them up. What are your thoughts? Did you have that purpose, that why, that that thing to really drive you? Yes, absolutely. I I, I... Totally think that's the case. And I think right from the beginning, my intention of being an entrepreneur was to be able to create impact at a scale that I could not have done if I was doing this by myself, right? That was what was my driving force. Everybody has different driving factors. For some, it could be impact. For some, it could be money. For some, it could be success or fame. 
I think I think there's no wrong answer. I think what you have to essentially be is very true to what you're really pursuing, right? That is really, really important. And I think when I talk about, I was talking to the other day, I was talk, I was advising and as an entrepreneur about how to find the right co-founder, and I was trying to tell him the same thing, which is everybody has different purposes in life, and as long as that purpose is pretty aligned with your co-founder and the team that you're building around you, I think it works really well. If there is a misalignment, then people are seeking very different things. I was pursuing the idea of I want to create a sizable impact in the ecosystem that I'm functioning. That is something that I always was very excited about. I always believed in, can I help other people in every small way, right? You talked about sports. I, I used to play tennis for my school. I played cricket very seriously. Uh, since you're from New Zealand, you understand cricket quite well. Oh, did, did, uh, did, we, did, did we beat you? No, you beat us? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I followed it that closely, but I just finished watching the Asia Cup and we gave a real strong beating to Sri Lanka, uh, which I quite enjoyed watching with my son. But going back to sports, I think sports is when it really kind of leadership and teamwork really starts playing out. Of course, you don't use those terms to really talk about your experiences on the field. Well, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I enjoyed the idea of kind of leading a team. I really enjoyed the idea of collaborating with other people. I enjoyed the idea of Working with a set of people with a very shared objective and trying to achieve that objective, whether it was winning a match or winning, winning a tournament or trying to achieve something. And that, I think, in many ways kind of set me up for, let me try to do something exciting. The, the idea of leading a team that has a shared goal and achieving that goal is really what got me very excited. And that's really how that translated into my excitement excitement of being an entrepreneur. Excellent. Now, we better get to that question about what does the company do just very high level, but I, and then I'll get into more about the leadership side of things as well. So what does the organization do? So Beacon Stack is, is, a, is a growth stage SaaS company. SaaS stands for Software as a Service. Uh, we are a classic cross-border SaaS company across India and the US. We are what Beacon Stack particularly does is we do what is called digital customer engagement, physical to digital customer engagement. We use technologies like QR codes, NFC, Bluetooth, etc. to kind of bridge the physical world to the digital world. We essentially help brands and businesses drive customer engagement, drive revenue, and most importantly, connect the physical world and the digital world with these technologies that are there. And the way we do that is using the mobile device because the technologies that I just mentioned are all there on the mobile device. And our larger vision is to make the mobile device the center of your physical world. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds exciting. That's good. So thanks for sharing that. Now, you, you sort of touched on it before as well, and we're going to be talking about leadership here, but how did you actually get into leadership yourself? That's a good question. I think it's not about getting into leadership as much as like I, I, I talked about it. I, I think I savored the idea of leading a small motley crew, whether it was on or off the field. I kind of always enjoyed that. And I, I, I like to believe that it came to me quite naturally. And I played cricket as a, as a kid. I was part of a tennis team that represented my school. And like I mentioned, I think the idea of having a shared objective and working really hard towards it was something that really excited me. And I think when I was in, in your teenage years, you don't really talk about it using the lenses of leadership. But I think that's when I roll back, I realized that's really where the seeds of leadership kind of kind of emerged in my head. And I was president of my student body when I was in my undergrad as a general secretary, as it's called. And I really enjoyed taking up responsibility, which helped, helped me kind of create that structure that can create a larger or wider impact beyond just me. I really enjoyed that always. That's actually, that's one. And the other angle, which I like to talk about is that my father, my grandfather, all of them are big political junkies. They love, enjoy politics. They, it's, it's like a family passion. I still enjoy talking about politics with my father. And I remember when I was very young, I used to, my grandfather used to take me to these talks and speeches by visiting politicians or, or policymakers. And that really got me excited with the whole political arena, the idea of how do you kind of sell an idea? How do you kind of take a team along? How do you take convince people about or sell, on, sell them on your vision of what you want to be able to do? So that also gave me a lot of perspective on if you want to be able to create something much larger than life, then the only way you'll be able to do that is take a larger set of people apart from yourself on that journey. And that in many ways is basically leading a team or leading a set of people. And 
that I think also really helped me kind of motivated me to get this, get into the arena of leadership. Mm, fascinating. Cause I think you used the words before about the seeds of leadership. And then you talked about the impact beyond me. So I think if you can sow those seeds of leadership to then be able to impact others beyond yourself, that's pretty cool. And, and the political side. So do you think you might ever want to run in a political kind of scenario one day? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think I enjoy the idea of serving in government. I enjoy the idea of creating policy that creates a lot of impact. I don't know if politics is for me, but I think, can I play a role of a, as a technocrat to be able to create some uh, fantastic impact in India? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, very good. Now, this person could be alive or from history. Who's your favorite leader and why? I think there's, it's very hard to mention one, but I think there's quite a few. And leadership for me in, in, in many ways is, there's this, I want to kind of talk about this a bit, which is, there's a very popular article by Ben Horowitz, who's a venture capitalist, and he talked about this article called The Wartime CEO and The Peacetime CEO. Have you read that? It's a very interesting one. And it talks about how leaders are of two kinds. There is a wartime C a leader and there's a peacetime leader. And he makes a very interesting point. And that's kind of been my favorite leadership article. And I'm sure he wrote it more than 10 years ago because I remember reading it, I think right around the time when I became an entrepreneur and he had written it. And for example, in that, like when you think about Winston Churchill, right? He was a pretty spectacular wartime prime minister. He did a great job. He helped Britain build, emerge out of uh, World War II. He kind of built that the Allied forces and brought the entire the Allied forces together against Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And he did a pretty spectacular job. I think he's a great, is a fantastic example of that. I, again, being and continuing with the political theme, I am a very big fan of Lincoln. If you've read Team of Rivals, it's, it's pretty amazing what he does in building a world-class team and you, it basically adopting his competitors, his rivals, and kind of creating the kind of impact that he does in the few years that he was essentially the president, right? I think those are two really good examples. I think from the business standpoint, I think there are obviously multiple multiple wartime CEOs who have done a really good job, whether it's Steve Jobs or it's, I think, Bob Iger from Disney. As They kind of came in when the company was really in a pretty bad shape and they kind of resurrected them in their own way, uh, in, in, in a spectacular manner. So I, I think it's interesting because when you think about leadership, you're mostly what's written about, what's praised is typically wartime leadership. I'm sure there are some really good examples of peacetime leaders who built a great, have built great companies during peacetime. But again, on top of my mind also, I, I can only think about wartime. And, and I, I think the reason also for that is because as an entrepreneur, I think 80% of your time is just being in the wartime mindset. Mm. Uh, there's very little of peacetime mindset building that you bring unless you're running a pretty large, well-established company. Yeah. Yeah. And then more than likely, if you're doing that entrepreneurship and you're doing the wartime kind of leadership, and then you get to the quite large and peacetime, more than likely, you're going to go off and do a new one because you're gonna, you want to yes. be in that side of things. So yeah, people tend to do that. Sharad, if I was to get you to say, you can choose Churchill or Lincoln. I've just chosen those two because I, mm -hmm. I sort of forgot from you there was a bit of a passion about those two gentlemen. If you were to have, if you were to sit in a park bench with one of them and having a coffee with them mm -hmm. and having a chat, would there be one question mm -hmm. that you would love to ask them? What would that question be? What's their question? I would ask them, how often or did they think about plan B? And one of the things that I always think about as a leader is I love this whole idea of no plan B is to make plan A work, double down on everything that you're really focused on and not really think about plan Bs. I really want to know if that's really true for people who created such legacy, created such amazing impact. I would love to know, did they really, if this plan A did not work, did they really have a plan B in mind? If the US did not join the war, what would have Churchill done? Would he have done something else? Did he have a plan B? Was there a plan B already in, uh, in the works? Those are things that I would love to know more about because I, I think the public narrative that most leaders like to paint is the fact that plan B is to make plan A work and you should not be kind of abandoning. This is very famous quote from JFK, I think, when, it's, when he talks about 
when he basically is talking to his brother and he talks about there's something immoral about abandoning your own judgment. And he basically talks about why he wants to do what he wants to do. So I think leaders are very focused on zoning into what they want. It's almost unholy to think about a plan B, right? It's almost like I have to only be doing this. But I want to know, if is that the mindset that makes you really succeed because you're burning all your ships? Or is that just the public narrative to kind of drum up the confidence of your team? But actually, in your reality, you're actually having a, another plan B in the works, if you know what I mean. I think it's a really good question to ask them. And uh, shame we're not going to be able to ask them. But uh, I wonder, listeners, <laughs> listeners, I wonder what you think about what Sherrod has just shared. What do you think should actually happen? But and if you want to, just feel free to send me, drop me a message and let me know what your thoughts are there. Sherrod, the title of the show here is called Leadership is Changing. When I say that title, that statement, what does that mean for you? I think leadership is changing in some ways. I think if you look at if I look at my parents' generation and you talk about leadership and you talk about a regular work environment or a corporate life, the way it was decided how a person leads depended on how many years of experience that person had. So if, if a person worked in a company for 10 years, odds are that person, because he, is, he or she has been at the company for 10 years, is going to manage a team of people who have been working there for five years. And a few person, and a few people, People who worked for 10 years are managed by people who have been there for 15 years. And the reason for that was because experience was knowledge. The fact that you've been at this for so long is the only way you essentially learn the skill, the craft that you're really at. But now that's not the case. Internet completely flattened that, right? There are podcasts, there are books, there are online forums. There are so many different ways to upskill yourself and equip yourself. And now your ability to learn is not really very linear. It could be exponential depending on who you are and what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, what really happens is experience is no longer to which you decide on how a person should lead. That's one. And the reason for that, more importantly, is the way you make decisions is no longer top down. It's no longer that the manager makes the decision and the people just follow. It's a more of an immersive decision-making experience where you empower people on your team to make the right decision, but you provide the guardrails to help them make that decision. I fundamentally believe in that. And one of the things that I tell every new hire that I make at the company is saying, I fundamentally believe in not micromanaging people, but micromanaging processes. So I focus on micromanaging the process. I, I, we agree to a process and we decide on that process and we, I obsess about that process. Once we get that our process and we agree that this is how X is going to be done, then I leave the complete flexibility to, to you to decide how you want to deliver or achieve the goal that we have set for ourselves in the confines of that process. And that's really the only way you should do it and you should be able to scale. Yeah, very good. Some really cool things there and what you just shared. Now, the other thing here is that you and I are tending to live in a world that just seems to be getting faster and faster, whether it's technology, whether it's social, data, and business. You're talking about SaaS companies, you're a SaaS company, organizations coming along all the time. In that fast-paced, ever-changing world, what's going to help a leader be successful today? I think it's. I think the first step is basically acknowledging the fact it's changing, right? I'm 40 years old, and if you're and I have a lot of people in my 20s, early 20s, who are part of my team, I can see a massive generational gap difference between just me and them. So I think what used to change every 30 years now changes every few years, right? And the very fact that you're acknowledging that. The priorities and objectives for someone who's in their 20s right now is very different from what I have right now or what I had when I was in my 20s is itself the first step in that direction. The second thing which I talked about, which I think I already talked about, is right now decision making is very empowered. People fundamentally believe in in questioning the, the status quo. And the reason they are questioning that is because they have information at their hand at uh, tip of their hand, which was not available in the past. So if you want to be able to make uh, the right decision, or more importantly than making the right decision, you want to be able to take a team along for the decision that you have, that you're about to make, it's really important for you to take your team along with you. And the only way you can do that is let them participate in the decision making. And that is really critical. Uh, I think without that, it's impossible to take a team along right now. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Now, the other thing too is that you and I have been talking through the lens of a leader. If we were to change lens right now and think about from an employee's perspective, maybe should ask, I should be asking your mum and dad. Maybe, maybe should I ask this question to them. 
But the thing is, what are employees or how has employees' expectations of leaders changed? Why well, is leaders changed? That's a good question. I think it's in the, in the same lines. I mean, when you talk about what do they want from their leadership, I need to think a bit more about this. I'm just trying to figure out if the employees have a different perspective. I think employees want to be heard a lot more. I think it's no longer about tell me what needs to be done and I will do it. It's more about in terms of tell me what has to be done and I'll figure out a way to get it done. It's no longer about tell me exactly what how it has to be done. Right. Based on my conversations with my team, etc., I feel like everybody here comes a lot more empowered in terms of what they want to be able to do. They have strong opinions about things that you would not have expected it, say, a 20 or 25 year old person to have. Things that I have learned on the job with experience is something that a person has is empowered and equipped in the early 20s because of what the Internet really provides to you these days. So yeah, that's really what I think about. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else specifically that employers really look for. Yeah, I think it's some really good things there. And I do hear that they do want to be more involved and have that purpose and do and get really involved and sort of be empowered to go away and, and make it happen, which is really good. So what you're sharing is really good. Yeah, I think the other thing that I want to also add here is that I also like to believe that it is very important today to be able to tell your employees and I would say just a team on the what's the larger purpose of what you're trying to do. I think most people are not just happy with working on their specific piece of work in a very siloed manner. Meaning, okay, what are you trying to do? So there's this very famous quote where you could ask anyone in NASA, including the janitor, and, and you ask him, what do you do here? And the janitor responds, I'm trying to put a man on the moon. There is a shared sense of purpose and vision. I think it's really important for you to be able to kind of distill that down to every employee. And I think employees seek that right now. It's not about I'm writing code, I'm writing a blog post, I'm putting a social media thing, I'm trying to sell a product. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to make Beacon Stack the world number one in customer engagement platform or whatever that is, right? That larger vision or maybe one step below that is is really important for them to understand because purpose becomes a lot more important as we kind of kind of progress. Yeah. And if people don't see that or can't hear it or don't understand it, they're not going to hang around the organization for very long and they're going to go and find somewhere else to go and work where, where it's actually quite clear, which is very important. Sharad, if I was to you, yeah, absolutely. if I was to ask you to think of, get your crystal ball out here now and talk about the future side of things, where do you see leadership being in five years? I think it's in some ways it's going to be the same. At the end of the day, the way I define leadership is the ability for you to empower people to make decisions. You want to be able to kind of upskill them and empower each individual to be able to kind of make the best decision they can rather than you make the decision for them. I think as we continue down this path, like I mentioned earlier, I just expect that people will participate in your shared vision when you give them the larger purpose rather than being very tactical about this is what you want to get done. And I think if anything, over the next couple of years and going forward, that will just keep increasing and increasing. You want that because I think it's like the master's hierarchy, right? You self-actualization is right at the top. When your basic sustenance, everything has been taken care of. And as there is more prosperity and as you kind of start building it, you will have more and more people trying to strive going higher and higher. So to be able to cater to that, you need to also leaders to be able to realize that people want that sense of purpose. And if you share that sense of purpose, it's a lot easier to carry out, carry a team along with you. Yeah, very good. Sharad, if people are wanting to get a hold of you, our listeners, where should they go to? I think LinkedIn is the best way to reach out to me. If you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm more than happy to connect. I'm quite active on LinkedIn as a platform. Yeah, excellent. Well, we're going to put Sharad's LinkedIn profile or the link to it in the show notes. So check that out if you're wanting to connect with him. Sharad, it's been a real pleasure working with you and talking with you today. So thank you so much for joining us on today's session or today's episode. Thank you, Dennis. It was lovely talking to you too. Thank you. Whether you go, listeners, great conversation there today. So it's about an organization that Sharat heads up that actually helps bridge the physical world with the digital world. And the thing here, he's, what he's talked about was, what's your driving factor? And if you can have the seeds of leadership to be able to impact beyond yourself, just imagine what could actually happen. You see, the thing here is, 
It's important to micromanage the process, but not the person. Hey, thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 